when we got here, I just, at first it was like, I'm just going to take a little break. And then it was like, just something in my body knew I couldn't go back. Um, and that's been really sad to me in a lot of ways, but it's something that I know I need to do. And then, um, um, so if, if some of those bishops were suspecting that you were a wolf in sheep's clothing, mm -hmm. were to know that, yep, as soon as you're not working for BYU-Idaho, mm -hmm. you left the church, which shows that you were just, in their minds, taking advantage of BYU-Idaho when you really were a wolf in sheep's clothing, how would you respond to that? They don't. I would... Um... Not the, First, would, I would say, I don't know what they're thinking, right? <laughs> like, I don't actually know what they're thinking. So, mm -hmm. But if somebody had that narrative, that's theirs to have. <laughs> like, if they're going to, if that's how they're going to be, that's on them. Mm -hmm. Not my problem. But how would you explain it? I wouldn't need to. How would you explain it to us, to your listeners? Like, um, I don't think I could say anything else right now. That I haven't said. Well, if, okay, I'll, I'll just ask it in a direct way. If, yeah. if you um, leave the church immediately after leaving BYU Idaho's employee, mm -hmm. maybe that says something about what your testimony and faith was while you were at BYU Idaho, that or, it wasn't what it should have been. Or maybe it says something about how tremendously devastating the experience of spiritual abuse is. Um, I still can't pray and that breaks my heart because if I start praying out loud it fires up old patterns that eventually become mental illness it's triggering it was taken from me I wish I still had it um, the closest thing I've had to praying is that there was one per so as a jazz musician we're improvising that's what the art is we're literally making up what we play in the moment and then there was a performance that i was doing with my brother in the cathedral of the rockies in boise and we were playing some sacred music that he wrote and it was actually the day after my awful interview with the last one bishop and i do have a recording of that if you want to hear someone screaming through a trumpet <laughs> in you know at the world for in experiencing those things. But um, one of the things that happened is I was in the middle of a solo and I realized that I was playing this this melody over and over again. It's a joy old jazz standard called Never Let Me Go. And I realized that something like deep in me was still like crying out to God, like, please don't let me go. Whatever that, whatever that is, like there's still something that wants that so much and it's in many ways been taken from me. And so I think that's how, like the idea that, the idea that some people will place this on me and th like I said, that's their business, but let's be clear about what they're doing. That's just another form of gaslighting. That's another way of them preventing themselves from looking inward and realizing that there are real problems that need to be addressed and they are not being addressed. Um, and if someone chooses to judge me that way, that's cool. I want them to know that I will be here to give them a hug when their world gets more complex and they can't be accepted by the black and white anymore. So that's what I would say but I desperately wish that I had that thing that was taken from me. And I, I wonder if it'll come back someday. I hope it does. For now, the only safe place that I can practice my spirituality is in my music. If I put language to it, it ends up backfiring. Holly, I saw you tearing up a bit as as he as Ryan was expressing some of those things. Is there anything you want to speak as someone not <laughs> who's who's been able to kind of watch him go through this and um, as he talks about spiritual abuse? 
uh, w- oh, abuse is so it's it's horrible by nature and it's really hard to see someone that I care about um and especially for someone that I've known uh since high school that his spirituality was at the core of his um life and part of his personality part of Ryan being able to be Ryan is us his having uh, a spirituality um and to see him have to redefine it out of survival because he's been hurt is is really hard to see and uh be thinking of ways that I've been hurt you know and just um talk about that uh ways that I've yeah. been hurt spiritual abuse um i me um it's so much tied to being a female and having that be within Mormonism tradition um, that being who I'm being told or who the people I'm being told how I'm supposed to be as a female and my spirituality is coming from men. Um, and I know that men also are down the totem pole as well. Um, but it's for me frustrating when I, uh, had my own spiritual voice and not, uh, and when I would share it, it almost was thanks for sharing and a pat on the head instead of it being, you know, seen equally. Um, for me to be not being able to have this, the, uh, growing up feeling like this space for me to be able to grow my own individual spirituality when there's a structure that is given to you and expected. Um, and my own spirituality now, I I don't believe in any deities. So I don't, I don't know. That was mo- most definitely from my experience And um, I think it's, uh, for me, it's, it's hard that that happened. I, I'm okay with where my spirituality is, where I've um, been out for me to be able to feel safe is like, is through nature. That's always been, and it's a huge part of humans' lives, but for me, nature's been a place where I've have felt peace and safety and where I can feel connected. My spirituality is the kind of uh, living energy that's connected to all humans as a human family, all living creatures and plants and, you know, the planet. So secular humanist <laughs> and then just finding spiritual healing and space within nature. Um, and it's just so frustrating as a human to see, (laughs) um, other humans get spiritually abused, uh, especially little children being, you know, their expectation. And then a grown man, another grown adult to feel that kind of pain isn't okay. So, How do each of you, how have each of you, um, kind of healed, uh, or not? Have you found ways to heal in, in each of you? I want you to kind of take that on separately. How do you bounce back? Uh, Obviously neither of you are joining a religion anytime soon. Your, your beliefs in God and, and Jesus have been, uh, impacted and that's very normal in, in the Mormon faith crisis sort of paradigm. How do you guys have any tips for others who have been spiritually abused for healing and growing beyond that? Oh, well, um, 
I had mentioned that I was, I've, one of my fears is my loved ones dying. Um, and it's always been that way. I think I'm starting to kind of, uh, have a healthier view about that. I think, um, us growing up, there is, uh, you know, growing up in a black and white environment, um, besides just theology of this life and next life. And, um, I think being able to try to develop a way I'm trying to do this present currently, um, developing a way that I can accept the unacceptable, uh, uh, accept that it's, um, what are words I'm looking for? We talked about it recently. Just, uh, that life is the impermanence of life. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you know, that's such a the uncertainty, the groundlessness, Yes, which is not what I came from. And I've been doing that for 36 years when I had left or old I was. Um, but to listeners that, that there is a way to be able to do that. And I am trying to develop that and, and to be able to be accepting and okay with not having a certainty with that and then being able to just put that aside so I can enjoy life with, with my loved ones. Is there, some would say, like I, somebody posted on Mormon Stories a comment the other day, the blog, that basically said, you know, uh, oh, we were talking about uh, the coronavirus and COVID-19 and people physically dying. And their basic answer was, you guys are way too negative. You guys think the death is the worst thing. I'll tell you what the worst thing is. The worst thing is the death of the certainty that the gospel brings. And I thought, wow. That, I mean, I kept the comment up. Sometimes I delete awful comments, but I kept that up because it was so kind of revealing and powerful that like Mormons really love certainty. It's mm -hmm. almost like an addiction. And so it's a big loss. And I have words to frame the trade and how I'm, I'm, I'm happy to trade the certainty for a set of other things that I receive. I'm wondering if you guys have any case to be made for how it's what you've gained as you've given up that certainty that's made the trade worthwhile. Does that make sense? Yes. That totally does. So for me, it was massively huge for me to be able to trade part of that certainty for me to not have any authorities over me. Mm. For me it's personally, that, it's, that. it's massive, huge part of the things that I was able to gain. Becoming your own authority is a huge deal for you. Huge, huge, huge. Yes. Um, and, you know, besides all the things we talked about through this whole um uh, interview that I wanted to protect and prevent. Um, you, you, you rescued your kids basically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you broke the, if, if from your perspective, you broke the chain. Yeah. Of abuse. Yes. Yes. That of patriarchy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that I'm a grown ass <laughs> adult and I get to be one. I can actually make my own decisions and my decisions are good. And I, so I can trust, I can trust myself, which I think is huge. You do, uh, when you go through a crisis of faith, your ability to be able to trust other people and yourself and authority, you know, it's, that's so often gone and destroyed, which was, but now I <clears throat> can trust myself and, and to be able to give yourself time and that it just takes time, you know, it takes time. And it's okay if you're really mad at, <laughs> Cause that's part of it and angry. That's, that's healthy. And as far as like, if you are a, a tolerant person and you might feel that you're not being tolerant towards the Mormon church, which is what I dealt with, you know, that I was able to go, it's all good. I got hurt by them. I eventually will be able to have space and have tolerance for them as well. Just needs time. Mm -hmm. anyway. That's good. Yeah. What do you want to add, Ryan, to that same question? Um, so there were two questions. One was what have you right, – tips you have for kind of re mm -hmm. re healing and recovering. And I want to – Okay, um, yeah. 
with that question, um, and I think for both of us, this has been integral too. Um, but my tip is you need to create, you need to like crew mm. and the best advice that I've ever been given about that is, um, just do what's obvious and ordinary to you. Don't try to create something good. Just make things. <laughs> what do you mean create? You mean create creative endeavors? Right, music, do art, sing, Cooking. You know, Cooking. cook, Cooking. writing, <laughs> write, poetry. scrapbook, po whatever it is, create. Woodworking. Like and and know that that what's ordinary to you is who you are. So you don't have to reach, you don't have to become incredible at something, but create for just for the sake of creating. And that will take you on its own. I think that that will take you on a path of self-discovery that, that absolutely is connected to the healing process. Um, for me, that's been really, really important. Um, uh, for yeah. Um, for me too, I needed language that would give me a sense of what was unfolding inside. And so some of the authors that have been really important to me for that are John O'Donohue, who I mentioned yesterday, Mary Oliver, the poet Joy Harjo, uh, the poet Walt Whitman, who talks about how the interminable rivers that we are as interminable as they uh, Pema Chodron has been really important for me. Rumi, Thich Nhat Hanh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. You've traded profits, basically. Mm, no. I would actually say the, the, the commons. So maybe I'll answer that with an Emerson thing. <laughs> the common theme in all of these people for me has been... Um, like Ralph Waldo Emerson got kicked out of Harvard Divinity School for giving a, an address where he said, everything divine about Jesus is in you too. And so he got booted. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the reason I would say I haven't traded prophets is because I'm not, I am not handing that center over to anything outside of me, but I am going to people who have walked the path more than me and allowing them to, point me to experiences that will uh, deepen my own roots. Mm. That's a different thing to mm -hmm. me. So that's why I would push against that. Um, so becoming your own prophet? No, I don't know. The, I can't, I'm, I'm not ready for the word prophet yet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's some, there's some so, uh, attachments, some negative associations. So, uh, I guess for me. Um, yeah. But. But they, but anyways, uh, Gregory Orr and Samuel Allen, that's my list of, of poets and writers who have been tremendously important to the way that I am rebuilding, a recovering and discovering, um, a relationship with myself. Um, so, um, and then the second question was. So that was my tips was so find language that helps you feel like you're building a relationship with yourself. That's that feels authentic to you and create. Um, and then I can't remember what the second question was now. Um, the trade you traded certain oh, trade. I traded certainty for empathy. Um, I traded certainty for, um, life, uh, for aliveness. Um, I traded certainty for the ability to see my children as beautiful whole beings on their own paths rather than as people who had to fit the script I had for them. Um, we traded certainty for a real relationship between us as individuals. And um, that's been just awesome. Like that's been so good for for our relationship to um, see each other as complex individuals and that we're not enmeshed. We're just, we're along that in the ride with this individual and we're just supporting each other as things unfold inside of us. Um, and you can't have that with certainty. 
Because if there's certainty, then there's no asking questions. And if there's no questions, the song dies. Right. So um, I don't think there can be intimacy and certainty. Maybe I'm, it would be interesting to hear you talk about that as a relationship expert. But in my experience, certainty always came from a place of fear. And grasping for certainty came for a place of fear. And so if that's where that person really was that made that comment, my heart goes out to them because it'll break. So I have some sense of what's coming. <laughs> so, And I've got two practical. Uh, oh, wait, can I just say one yes, thing? Yes. Okay, don't forget what you were okay. just about to say. Okay. That there's a tidnot. Thich Nhat Han quote that comes to mind, and he's talking about romantic relationships, but I'm going to paraphrase, but he basically says, if you're driving in the car with her and you don't really ask her any questions, you know, because you think you know everything about her, basically, she will die. And what, what he means is the relationship will die mm -hmm. because there's always a mystery. Mm -hmm. And it's, in the, it's the mystery, it's the uncertainty, it's the unknown that allows a relationship to be driven to deeper and deeper levels. Mm. I think that applies to yourself. I think that applies to relationships in a marriage or in, you know, committed relationship. I think that applies to a parent child relationships. I think that applies to healthy organizations. So in that sense, I, I think questions and uncertainty, um, provide life. And certainty and a lack of curiosity are fatal to individual well-being and relational well-being. Mm. Is that that's my reaction? What do you think? I love that. <laughs> mm. um, um, and then the other thing that I traded. Oh wait, and then sorry, you had your. Were you gonna? Well, th th this is actually additional. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you can. Okay, so yeah, don't so forget. Finished. Yeah, I got okay. it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Ryan. No, that's so. And the other thing I traded my certainty for, because certainty. If we go back to yes, talking yesterday and that experience when I was a kid reading the Velveteen Rabbit and and just knowing in my heart that I wasn't real, um, I traded certainty for knowing that I am. Mm. And I've had that come up in really, I went on a retreat, uh, Gina Colvin hosted a retreat, a spiritual retreat that was all about thinking about thresholds. And, um, and I had a, a little dialogue with myself that I wrote down as it was happening, which I think I'll just read real quick. Um, but so th myself asked me, what are you afraid of? Because I was considering leaving, uh, the church and, my response was, what if I'm wrong? And myself said, you will be. <laughs> mm. And then I said, well, what if I lose all the social capital I've built up for all these years? What if my friends will no longer hear me? And something inside me said, they are where they are. They need their time and their space with you or without you. You've been called to the threshold. It's time. And then I said, I'm afraid to follow. And myself said, follow what? And I said, the burst inside. It tore so much apart. And then something inside me said it tore flimsy cloth. Mm. We're not trying to weave a new cloth. And I said, well, I'm afraid to disappoint those that I love and respect. And myself said, you will. They can't see where we are going or where we are. And I said, my fears have been my support. It's how I know I'm here. And then something inside said, let go. And then I said, I'm like, question mark, I'm. And then the something inside said real. And so to go from that feeling to have that come up that naturally inside me meant the world to me. The response to who I am is I'm real. And I had to give up certainty to come to that. Mm. So and it's been worth it for you. For sure. I would not, I wouldn't even all the things that have happened. I, they, they, help soften me and deepen my empathy. And um, that's what I hope to have keep happening. So beautiful. So good. Holly. 
Um, I just have a couple of practical uh, things of advice Love it. or tidbits. Um, and this is to parents who have kids that are no longer going to be in the Mormon realm. Um, so, especially if you're like in a predominantly Mormon community. So your children... Within Mormonism, you've got, there's lots of activities. So there's so many different networks and community groups and things that they're a part of. And when that's taken, the little kids definitely feel um, a lack and that they're kind of, they're an exclusion. So I think um, if you're able to find uh, interests that your kids have and, you know, try out some things. So, you know, there's, there's like 4-H and there's, usually a lot of activities at local uh, libraries that can be part of reading groups um, and then after school clubs and things like that. But I think it is really important to be able to find a way that you can fill those voids because those are very much going to be there, especially if you're in a Mormon community because all those kids know each other from uh, school, or excuse me, from church and uh, like mutual and stuff like that. Um and then the other thing, which I'm in the process of trying to put together, is now uh, within Mormonism, if you may have a pioneer ancestry, even if it's not that, now you've got a, you were pre-existence, you've got a long origin. So for you to be able to develop a community, an origin that your kids have, you can have a mixture of that. So I'm trying to, now to develop different um find different photographs of actual just uh, past family members and find just stories that I think would be ones that they could enjoy and be able to connect to and have an origin group. Um, and you could even do like, I don't know, I've got Celtic origins, you know, so I thought that that could even be something that I could draw from just for them to have something. I think that's important. I think helpful could be a helpful thing as well. So love it. Practical yeah. solutions. Yes. You need parenting. some of those. <laughs> so your kids are doing okay. They're not, uh, falling off the way. I mean, it's always hard to raise kids. It's hard to be a kid right. in 2020. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You're right. But you're, but your kids are, you feel like they're doing okay. I think, yeah. I, think I mean, what parents going to say no. Right. But well, yeah. yeah. And I think they're surviving. It's, it's still been hard. The move has been yeah. hard. It's hard to do this in Utah too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To leave the church in Utah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not but, a trivial thing. Mm -mm. But yeah, I think they're, yeah. Surviving. I think it's, it's getting a little easier, I think. I think the moves get starting to get easier. Year by year. They're amazing. Yeah. They're just awesome little people. And so dang brave. In their way. Man. So brave. Our daughter and our son just have told stories of, anyway, how they've uh, stood up for other people. <laughs> I thought that, but I've, you know, they're at their age, but man, they're pretty brave. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. And then I, I don't think I full of someone asked where I am with the church now. I actually, um, um, just two weeks ago, finalized the process of submitting my name for resignation, which is again, something that's heartbreaking to me. Um, why was that important? A lot of people are trying to decide if, I just, if they should make that choice. And some people are like, I don't want to give the church power. It, I don't think the church is true. So resignation is irrelevant. It's meaningless, and it and it it validates power in a way that some people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Others just don't want their name associated with it. it. It feels almost dirty or like a yeah. a weight bearing them down. Some it's a matter of conscience. Um, some don't want to be followed and tracked. Mm -hmm. Others want to stay in so they don't break the heart of their parents, or you know, or so that they can keep their options open. There's so many different factors to to think about. Yeah. What, what would you? Well, I would want to first just validate and honor every one of those thoughts that people have as they come to what is going to be the right move for them. Um, for me, I mean, part of it was knowing I was still. I think if we still lived in Boston, that maybe I wouldn't have because interesting I, because there wouldn't be this. Um, there's there's just there's a certain type of ecclesiastical leader in the Wasatch Front in Idaho 
that is wanting to get points but to move up the ladder by proving their loyalty by catching people they deem to be dangerous. And so I'd had enough experience with that that I just was done wondering if that could ever happen again. And I did have one interaction with our current bishop that suggested to me that that would be possible. <laughs> Not so. so I just, there was a part of me after that that was just like, I will never again place someone above me in that way. And if that means that I have to do this, then that is what I will do. Even though it scared me. I hesitated on this for the last six months. Um, it still scares me. When I did it, my heart was pounding in my throat. Um, all those, all that conditioning came up really strong. And so it was really scary to me and really sad to me to even have to be considering it. But that's what I knew I had to do. So... That's what it is. Mm. And just to kind of close, uh, it sounds like you both would characterize yourselves as psychologically healthier and happier. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, it seems like your marriage has been strengthened by this, not weakened by this. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And it seems like it it feels to you guys like you're giving your children a better life experience or a healthier set of options or choices than than if you had raised them in. I think so. That's my hope. Yeah. <laughs> That's the hope. I feel that way. And then yeah, just trying to develop and learn what I and missing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, have you guys um, found community to replace or at least supplement or to even supplement the post-Mormon community you had in Rexburg? Right. I, well, up on campus has been at the U. That's, that's a great community. At the U of Everybody at, uh, no. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, here in Salt Lake? Yes, yes, You yes. commute here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You found community here? Yeah, yeah. Just with, with the students and some of the faculty and some of the other grad students. It's the art program? Yes. What? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's just nice to <laughs> find even more like-minded mm -hmm. people, and that's, it's nice. That's kind of, it's relieving. Um, and as far as with our kids, we're still, you know, we're finding little bits and still trying to find their niche, still working on that, but. Have you guys heard about the the Thrive community in Springville that Jenny and Clint Martin have? No. No. You haven't heard about that? Uh -uh. Oh, well, just my my dear friends, Clint and Jenny Martin, who we did, we did the first couple Thrive events together. We've set up like 50 little support groups um, across the country, and they run a, a Thrive group in Springville that meets a couple times a month on – a Wednesday night or a Sunday and they have food and they have potluck and they have music and they kids play games and they, they do a book club and they all kind of talk. Sometimes they've had 50 or hundred people there. Nice. You guys haven't heard about that? No, this is, it sounds this awesome. Good. Yeah. Okay. Post, we'll do a post pandemic hang. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it's, that would be when great. When it's safe to do that again. Yeah. They, they have it to cancel for now, but yeah, they're great people and there's a lot of great people. And there's also the Utah Valley post Mormon community. Have you guys heard about that? No, yeah, because Ryan has mentioned that he would still like to find somewhat of, you know, a community. Because, you know, like, I don't know, not compare myself to, mm, like, veterans, when, you're go when you've had some kind of experience, it's difficult for sometimes for someone else who hasn't experienced it to know where you're coming from. So, like, veterans understand each other and <laughs> post Mormons. So it's. Mm -hmm still i think helpful yeah anyway. and also yeah also just just to find friends and people to hang out with and do life together with and to have your back and to talk oh. about parenting yeah. and relationships and yeah so yeah the utah valley post mormon community is the largest post mormon community in the world wow they've got like over 2000 members oh, it's wow. very active they have mm. co coffees and meetups and activities and all sorts of stuff. It may or may not be your type of thing, but 
That's, you know, that we, we were told at one point that the bad thing about Utah is all the Mormons and the good thing about Utah is all the post-Mormons. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I love all the Mormons in Utah, you know, and, and post-Mormons can be an annoying. So, <laughs> but, but certainly it's true that Utah has got the, the most awesome post-Mormons in the world. So that's, uh, that's at least a silver lining if there's a cloud. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So check those out. And listeners, you can go to mormonspectrum.org slash map to see a, a Mormon Spectrum community near you. And you can go to thrivebeyondmormonism.com. And there's a map there where you can find a local Thrive group to help you find community. If you're interested in that kind of thing, it's all free. It's all just volunteers. And you don't need to be alone. And you don't even need to talk about Mormonism. You can just... Try wine together if you're into that, or do a book club, or go to movies, or have play dates, or just get togethers, camping, whatever it is. Like it can be just about that as well. Not to mention Waka. Have you heard of Waka? No. What? <laughs> so how do we survive? <laughs> so Waka is women of a certain age. It's a support group for post Mormon women who are forty and above, and they have some subgroups for under forty. Mm-hmm. Are you forty or We're above? above forty? Yeah. Okay. We're 40 above. Yeah, yeah, and and they, it's 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 a thousand or more women now across the Wasatch Front who just do women's events and activities together awesome. and book clubs and camps and you know retreats and uh, activities. It's it's great. So you can go to Waka Worldwide and Facebook, fill out their little application. And you can find immediate friends wherever you are in Utah and sometimes elsewhere. So sounds awesome. Yeah, just a few plugs. Yeah, <laughs> check those out. Good plugs. All right, so uh, we're we're coming to the end. Yeah. Um, any final things you guys want to say before we close, or have you said it all? I mean, I just keep kind of marveling at how, from my perspective, this is playing out like that. Like I said, the uh, the writing I did about this to process it over the summer, I ended up calling it Holly and Eve because uh, <laughs> I just feel like she's been such a, a powerful leader in our home. And, um, and like I said, I can't fathom the courage or the suffering, the loneliness of it. And, um, and I am super grateful that we have each other to walk through this together with and the support that, that I felt from her is just absolutely amazing all all, the whole way through. Um, so yeah. Thanks. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. How about you? You can work out. Um, what did you say? I, I said it. Yeah, it could work out. What does that mean? Uh, Oh, oh, I don't know. Supporting each other. Uh-huh. I don't know. But, um, that was a nice I, tribute. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. Really nice. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. <laughs> and for those who are afraid to make to make the jump, who are in the middle of the fear and the feeling overwhelmed about the implications of navigating their faith and, and potentially making a change. Any words of hope you want to give? I, I think keep going. And I, I've talked to a few people who uh, didn't talk to their spouses about it and kind of were discovering things on their own and were so afraid that their spouse would leave them. And so far it seems like the majority haven't. Um, and so, and I don't know that is such, that is a whole world that I didn't experience. Um, so I just think, oh, you know, hang in there and maybe if you're afraid to tell your spouse or your family members and stuff like that, it might work out because it seems like the majority of the time it still can. Sometimes it doesn't though, but, but that you're not alone. You're not alone. So many people out there. So yeah. You're not alone. Not alone. That's not, alone. not bad. Yeah. Well, Ryan, I want to hear you. Uh, I want to hear you play music sometime. 
Okay, all my all my gigs got canceled because of the coronavirus. <laughs> well, we'll have to. Otherwise, there would be all sorts of opportunities coming up for for that. It's had a lot of things coming up, but they're gone now. But all right. Well, this is. I'm. I'm just saying. I want. I want to see your music at some point. That'd be great. And Holly, I want to see your art. Okay. At yeah. some point. Yeah, and I could share some of the stuff that I've been doing right now because it's kind of anyway. I've been dealing with sort of. Facing some past trauma and kind of what are you doing? Solving it. Um, I'm doing abstract stuff. My oh. background is illustration, so it's been figurative. Um, but I think that's kind of been a really good platform and realm to do that because feelings and memories and things like that can be abs- are abstract, and I think it's been a safe place for me to be able to. Uh, visually express those anyway so like picasso stuff or salvador dali stuff or no more none of that? yeah more uh the there's Holly. it's not quite fitting into a niche my good. professors have been saying good yeah, that's school. good yeah but you don't I need guess some a man to, to be associated with <laughs> yeah it's your own oh my it's your gosh. own style yeah i'm no, fine and yeah, anyway some of them had some Holly amazing esque. wives that cooney his wife was just anyway just as good but forgotten anyway that's another story um yeah just for probably like expressionists abstract expressionists could be that the closest so now i'm really intrigued yeah (laughs) that's good yeah and her mfa show will be next april right um april june yeah in the spring yeah in the spring this month or next year a year from now okay yeah Yeah. all right yeah so i want to i want to see it that'd be awesome all right. Yeah. Send, send us an invite. And then that I'm, good. like I said, I'm working on recording that suite about Elijah Abel this year. Um, and I'll be doing that with members that there's a band that I'm in called the Kobe Watkins group tet, um, which, uh, we released our first album together in 2018 and the Chicago Tribune very graciously named us one of the top 10 albums of the year. Whoa. And, uh, it's, so if you want to go hear some of what we do, you can, just go to YouTube and type in Kobe Watkins group tet and find some music there. Um, but yeah. And so those are the people that I'll be recording the Elijah Abel suite with. And hopefully that'll come to fruition finally this year. And they're like, what so, is all this weird Mormon stuff you're doing? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's perfect. <laughs> so beautiful. Um, all right. Well, you guys are just lovely. This has been so healing. The comments have been uh, really uh, complimentary. Go back and check those out. Everyone loves your stories. I've loved your thoughtfulness and your spirit and your sensitivity and wisdom. So this has been a grand slam from my perspective. So thank you for taking the time to tell your stories. Thank you, John. Thank you. And stay in touch. We will. Sounds good. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah. Keep doing, keep creating. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us on Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, Stay in touch, mormonstories at gmail.com. Stay safe. Sanitize your hands. Wash your hands. Don't shake hands. Don't hug. Socially (laughs) isolate. And and, uh, stay away from earthquakes. And um, But thanks for all the support. Uh, If you do support us, thank you. If you don't support us, Mormon Stories at... uh, uh, dot org uh, donate button you can uh, become a monthly subscriber help keep this podcast alive less than something like one half of one percent of our listeners actually donate if one percent of our listeners donated we would we would be able to do this for years and years and years to come so please become a donor and a supporter if you can and um, please uh, recommend us share these episodes like us on Facebook Give us positive reviews on Facebook or on iTunes and uh, do whatever you can to support us because uh, we need your support. So uh, thanks again. Uh, Also, I love your ideas. So email us at mormonstories at gmail.com if you have ideas on other episodes we can do. And um, just keep living wonderful, glorious lives of light and truth uh, like our wonderful guests today. Uh, Ryan and Holly Nielsen. So Ryan and Holly, thanks again. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Take care.
You too. And uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Bye, everybody.